Okay, welcome. What we're trying to accomplish today is uh, to help student athletes make wise decisions in the recruiting process as it pertains to college athletics. And uh, with us today, we have men's basketball coach from Hofstra, Joe Mahalik, women's soccer coach, Simon Ridiow, and the baseball coach, John Russo. Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, first thing I think we want to have as discussion is uh, just what constitutes a scholarship. I know some are full scholarships like basketball. It's a full ride, and that's the biggest word we hear. Everyone got a full ride. And I know from soccer and baseball, it's a little bit different. So maybe, Joe, you can start off and just tell us what your, con your scholarship takes in, and then maybe John and Simon can jump in and just explain the whole process as far as academics and uh, what actually comes with the scholarship and things of that nature. Well, uh, for starters, I think it's simple with, with, with Division I men's basketball and women's basketball. It's a little more complicated with soccer and, and baseball. Uh, men's basketball, you're allowed to have 13 people on scholarship. You can't take a scholarship and split it up. If he's on scholarship, he's on scholarship. So you have 13 people on scholarship. And a full scholarship is room, board, tuition, books, and fees. Uh, but it gets a little more complicated, I think, with these guys. So I'll let them speak more to it. Yeah, from the uh, women's soccer perspective, we have 14 full scholarships. Similar breakdown to what Coach Joe mentioned. However, we can split the scholarships up. Uh, so from our perspective, the ideal student athlete is somebody who's got 1,200 SATs, uh, 3.5 GPA, who may get uh, a substantial amount of academic award. If they can get 40% academic money, then we can split our scholarship up to 60%. And then that's the perfect student athlete. Somebody who has good academics, who's a very good soccer player, can get fully funded with a combination package. Um, and that's how we kind of try and do it. We can split up any kid, any percentage. So we can have a 5% kid, a 10% kid, a 50% kid, or a full ride kid. Um, all in all, trying to fulfill the roster limitations at the university. And then I'll pass it on to John because he's got a slightly different scholarship model. Um, we have 11.7 .7 scholarships for the baseball program, and we can carry, um, we have to carry at least 35 kids total. Um, with the minimum we can give anybody in a baseball scholarship is 25%. So if you get any type of baseball money, it's 25%, and then it can work upwards. Here at Hofstra, where it's you know a private school, we're looking for more um, kids that get academic money, so the 3.5, the 1,200 SAT. Those are NCAA regulations that are the minimum requirement that you could have to get academic money and package it with uh, academic uh, uh, scholarships from a sport. So if you can get academic money by meeting the minimum of 1,200, and then we can package baseball, soccer, uh, other sports monies together, that's the kind of student athletes we're looking for. Great. Next uh, topic, a recruiting timeline. I have a student athlete. What grade am I being viewed as a, as a prospect or a recruit? And how does it work? How does it work as far as contact? I know in the past I've heard, uh, I got a letter from University of Maryland. I'm being recruited. That's not always the case. So maybe, Joe, you could start off with, what's the process? Do you view somebody? Is it somebody contacts you? you know, how do you know who's a prospective student athlete for your program? I'll talk about our, pro our process and, and how we do that. And before I do, first of all, we may have to translate for, for Simon because, <laughs> because he speaks English. The rest of us, we speak American, the rest of us, he speaks English. So if you can't understand him, we'll let you know what he says. Um, so, so I think this, this whole process can really get skewed when a big school, let me just use them as UCLA, sends a letter to somebody in ninth grade. Mm -hmm. It just screws everybody up, especially the student athlete. Because now this young kid in ninth grade says, I'm going to UCLA. And they only sent him a letter because they saw that he was 6'4 already in ninth grade. So it screws up the whole process. What we do, what I ask my staff to do, know who's out there. Know who's out there. If there's a ninth grader and you heard he's a pretty good player, just know about him. Know about that sophomore. Maybe start to contact the sophomore a little bit. But let's go slowly. Let's not screw the process up. Uh, and then once he gets to be a junior, then we start to really fire in. But, uh, you know, too many things can happen. There's too many moving parts, and, and not to belabor the point, but I think what screws up everything is that people are getting ahead of the game here. And in our sport, 
UCLA is sending letters to kids in ninth grade, and these kids may not be good enough to play at Hofstra, and everybody's all screwed up. So that's why there's 750 transfers a year in men's basketball. It's because of things like this. But we could talk 20 minutes about that. Coach? Yeah, uh, women's soccer is probably ahead of most recruiting um, sports in, uh, in the whole process. We're not allowed to contact a kid until she's an 11th grader. Uh, via email or phone call or whatever. However, some schools can, well, we can contact a kid about camps and clinics prior to that. And so they can be on our radar and on some schools' radars. Some schools are now getting commitments from 2019 grads, which is uh, predominantly freshmen in high school. Um, Hofstra tends to look at kids who are going into junior year, so the summer between sophomore and junior year is when we really put pressure on. Um, and that when I say pressure, we contact and start reaching out and getting kids on campus on a recruiting visit. Uh, so <coughs> different sports have very different. Softball and women's lacrosse are very similar to soccer, and they're a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to recruiting. Um, some of the men's sports tend to be a little bit slow in the process. Um, and the final point is it's all, until senior year, it's all a verbal commitment uh, in women's soccer. and. You have to trust the coach that he's going to stick to his verbal commitment and we have to trust the student athlete that they're going to stick to their verbal commitment. And again, I'm going to pass you on to John because I'm sure he's got something very different to say about his recruiting process. Um, our, uh, our standards are pretty much the same. We can start recruiting you in 11th grade, making contact. Um, there is 10th graders that commit. Uh, how that happens is they attend probably the camps of the schools they're going to. And then once they're on campus, they can have conversations with the coach and see the coaches. You know, the, the falsism in my sport um, is, is kind of similar to Joe's, is that kids go to these tournaments, and they're at a big tournament, and the coaches get these booklets. And then after the booklet is uh, passed out, they go back and they send out a letter to everybody that was at that uh, tournament, and they say, hey, we really liked watching you play. You should come attend our camp. And then a kid will take that as they're now being recruited by North Carolina or whoever it is because they sent them a letter saying they liked watching them play, but they liked to attend the camp. The truth is is they're just trying to, to get the camp numbers out. They're not necessarily being recruited by that school. I think you're officially being recruited when coaches are talking to you and they're saying, hey, we want you. Here's how you fit us. Um, they, they're trying to get you on campus, show you the school. So until you're having – direct contacts with a coach, talking about specifics. I don't really think you're being recruited up until that point. One of the other things, what if I'm a parent of a high school athlete, what can I do to make my son or daughter more recognizable? I know one of the big things now is everybody has a private trainer and everybody has a video. I mean, where do you guys go with that? Is it, it does that something that they should be looking at? Is it can you get noticed? And the next question really kind of dovetails into that is the high school season versus the travel club season. Where, where do we look for kids? What's as a parent? What should I be doing? <laughs> for me, the um, I don't get much in it. We get into the video just getting to see or see somebody. Somebody will say, "Well, how do you uh, be able to tell something on a video?" I, I usually equate it to this: is if you give a mathematician a math problem. He can usually figure out the math problem. Same with coaches. If you're, you're looking for specific stuff that you already teach or do. So if you, in my sport, if you see a baseball swing, I'm looking for kids that swing like what we teach. And so that'll eliminate somebody really quickly or move somebody ahead really quickly. The other thing is, is we attend a lot more travel, um, travel games more so than high school games because we're able to see um, more kids in one spot. So we're able to see guys throwing harder to uh, hitters facing it. instead of high school games where maybe only one or two guys on the field are enough talented. It's hard for us to get a good read in the sport of baseball to know enough about it. So the travel programs, the summer baseball, is a bigger part of our recruiting process than, than the high school season itself. Yeah, I concur with John. Um, most of our recruiting is done through the travel uh, programs. Uh, we do go to high school games. Uh, it's mainly to show love to kids who we've already identified. And in reference to uh, Teddy's first question, parents and what they can do, I think they can get away from the kids 
give the kids ownership to the recruiting process, let the kids do the emails, let the kids interact with the coaches. Um, we live in a world now where parents are way too involved in the whole process. They're way too involved with discussion with coaches. They're way too invested in their own children to understand that we're looking from an unbiased perspective. And this is where we see your, your child. Uh, we get we get the bias aspect. We all we all uh, parents here. However, the best thing you can do for your kid is let them get through the process and guide them, and don't don't over over parent. Yeah, I'll just add on to that because I think those are great comments. I think parent. I'll be honest with you. Parents can turn off. They can turn us off. If parents just start doing too much, you start to just think, Wow, do we really want somebody around whose parents are going to be that involved? Your job as a parent is to get them on the right team, get them with the right AAU team, make sure they get to the exposure camps, make sure they get seen. But then it's up to if the kid's good enough, he's good enough. Uh, but if you need to keep sending emails, I mean, it, it's going to turn some coaches off, I think. So, What about basic eligibility? Anybody could take this. What do you need to get in? What do you need to stay active? And I think that's kind of a misnomer out there. People don't understand you could be the best athlete in town, but – you have this certain NCA requirements. What, I know there's some entrance, and then once you're in, John. There's minimum of the uh, core classes. He has, I think he has to have 16 graduating from high school. So every every school has a compliance office. So like when we're recruiting somebody, we just ask them to send their transcripts. Then their transcripts come to our school. Usually we can get them access, uh, assessed within uh, two to three days after receiving. Them. So then they take their high school classes. They get their uh, core classes and see if they match up with NCA standards, not so much school standards, NCA standards. And then after that, there's SAT, ACT scores, and it's basically a sliding scale. There's not one minimum for the SAT and one minimum for the GPA. It's a sliding scale that they work back and forth together. So, like, you know, let's say if you have a 2.0 uh, GPA, you have to have somewhere in 1100 SAT. If uh, you have a 2-5, then your SAT score moves down that it can be less to be eligible by the NCA. So everything's done off a sliding scale. It rotates a little bit each year. It's a little bit uh, more detailed than finite because it depends what classes are transferred into the school. And so sometimes a student might say, well, hey, I have a 3.1 GPA, but then they get assessed by our compliance, and that might move it down to a 2-7 because some uh, classes aren't accepted by the NCAA according to um, what the high school standard was and the NCA college standard was. Yeah, um, what, what I would suggest is make sure you talk to your guidance counselor at high school. Um, the, the sliding scale keeps moving, and it's consistently moved over the last four or five years. It used to be this, and now it's this, and now the GPA has got to be higher than it used to be. I think, uh, I think next year or the year after, it's a 2.5 minimum. Um, and that's where the guidance counselor can double check with the actual official rules because it does change every other year. Um, so, so from an academic perspective, I'll relate it back to my first answer. The better you are academically, the more appeasing you are to our sport as well as baseball and as all, also <laughs> basketball <laughs> in the sense that we all want quality student athletes you know, it doesn't affect the scholarship perspective on basketball, but it affects the culture of the program. And, and we're always looking for high, intelligent players. And the only thing, that's great stuff there. The only thing I'll add is do it sooner rather than later. Get in there. If you're starting to think you want to play college athletics, whatever level, Division One, Two, II, or Three, maybe when you're a sophomore, get in there with your high school guidance counselor, Get to know these rules a little bit. Don't wait till your senior year and say, oh, my gosh, I need a 2.5 and I didn't take the ACTs and you can only take so many classes as a senior core courses. Get in there your sophomore year. Get to know that stuff a little bit. Don't, let, don't wait till the end. I'm going to throw out a couple terms and someone just jump in and give a perspective. It's key words around. NCAA Clearinghouse. If it's still... Still a thing? Is you have to something? register with the clearinghouse. It's very, very important. Go to your high school guidance counselor. Uh, ask them about the clearinghouse. They will know. But every high school student athlete needs to register with the NCAA clearinghouse before they can do anything with us. Okay. Next thing. Verbal commitment, national letter of intent. Again, um, I'm a man by my word, so a verbal commitment for me is binding. However, legally, it is not. And in some sports, uh, 
you see on football signing day, you see football players who have committed to a school still have three hats with different schools on. And when, when the time comes, they pick up a different hat that they're verbally committed to. Uh, that's not happening in women's soccer that often, but it's definitely going to happen. Um, and we have to just trust each other. We have to trust the coach who's making the verbal commitment, and we have to trust the player who's making the verbal commitment. However, again, it is not legally binding. And uh, under normal rules, that doesn't really stand for anything until you sign the NLI, where the National Letter of Intent Day, when you sign that letter, that is more legally binding and that is more concrete when it comes to scholarship and, and aspects on roster and being on a team. Hey, John, I have one for you. Explain the red shirt, what it is. They came to my son and daughter and told them they would like to come, but you're going to red shirt. The red shirt, you know, gets uh, very specific. Uh, you can't play in a game. You can't enter it for uh, one minute, two minutes, 30 seconds. If you get into a game, then the only kind of me uh, sh red shirt you can get is called a medical red shirt. And then how a medical red shirt, it has to show that a doctor says you couldn't come back at any point during that season to play. So let's say if you broke your uh, finger and you could come back in four weeks, but the season is eight weeks long, you cannot get a red shirt. Um, so you apply for a medical, but if you break your wrist and it says it's out for three months and that's more than the season, you can apply for a medical red shirt. A regular red shirt is very important because once you've entered into a game, like let's say baseball, you get one at bat or you pitch one pitch or you're just on the field for one defensive out, you lose your shot at redshirting. Um, also, if you play at uh, uh, on the medical redshirt, if you play any point past the halfway point of the season, you lose the right to medical redshirt uh, in that sport. I think it's the same for all of us, right? So yeah, so one minute, one second on the field, you can't redshirt. So it's a decision that has to be made before the season starts, and then um, you know probably you know usually agreed on to both sides or whatever between the player and the coach, and uh, it's usually the coach's decision. Coach wants to do it, and you don't want to do it. It, it. The coach has the final say on that. Multi-sport athlete, it's a big thing. I know in soccer, it's a big thing. Should they be playing multi-sports? Should it be three season person, one season? I know most travel teams now want you to play all year round. They want to train you and. Taking, I know with soccer, there's been a debate even to play in high school, right? So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm probably going against the the wave of uh, common sense in in America. The the academies are pushing for soccer players to just focus solely on soccer for nine months. You no know, high school soccer, I'm against it. I think high school soccer is a fantastic experience for every every student, and uh, playing with your friends is very different to playing with. Uh, high elite athletes and I can go on with a plethora of different excuses of why I prefer it. Multi-sport athletes I love. Um, I'm not all about one sport athletes and unfortunately I'm going against a lot of uh, vogue going on in, in women's soccer anyway. I think a kid should play women's basketball, lacrosse, field hockey, soccer, whatever they can do. I think they need to learn different sports. I think it's good for the body and I you know, we're getting a lot of injuries right now, and I'd be surprised to say that it's not because people are specifying on one sport for nine months and just using the body one certain way and overusing it. No, um, like right now, I dealing. I have a 12-year-old that plays uh, travel softball, travel volleyball, and both travel programs are wanting her to make a year-long commitment in it. And you know, at the end of the day, I think it's your money. You're spending it how you want to, and. I don't think the travel programs themselves can dictate what you're going to do as a family or as a, a person. I think at 12 years old, she's too young to decide if volleyball is her favorite or softball is her favorite. So you know, I think let it play out. I think once you get into high school or older and let's say you've signed a basketball scholarship or agreed to a basketball scholarship and you don't want to get hurt playing another sport, then that's a life decision. I think we'd all agree with that and we'd all be it. But I think up until when you had it, I, I think as you could play as many sports uh, experience as much as you can in life, you know, keep doing and keep playing. One thing I want to ask and just quick answer, John, the number one mistake in recruiting. Not enough information. Simon? Uh, players committing way too early. Uh, the process is such that we don't really get to know the kids as, and see them as much as we want. So 
the evaluate I wish the evaluation could be better. I know at our college we offer a large array of uh, camp programs for the summer, one of the largest summer camps in the country. Uh, maybe each quickly could give a little statement about what you think the value of being on a college campus for the summer and working with the coaches who are here all year and just maybe gaining an experience that you wouldn't get anywhere else. John? We have a, a, a baseball program here called the New York Baseball Academy. And um, last two summers, over the course of six weeks, we've had over 1,300 kids. And, you know, put a really strong aspect on actually teaching uh, the game the right way. You know, I think with these travel programs, uh, it's more about playing games than learning how to play. And, you know, I think that that's the reason for the New York Baseball Academy being so successful is, you know, you have a, a combination of a great program that Hofstra has here you combine it with the New York Baseball Academy itself, you know, to not uh, sound cliche, but it's almost a home run. You know, kids, your kids get to learn the aspects. They get to, to see Hostra's campus. They get the, the, the lunch, the, the travel, the everything taken care of. And then on a, any given day, you're going to be happy that your kid comes home and can tell you he knows how to do cutoffs and uh, relays and rundowns and bunting and, you know, get teach the, the taught the aspects of the sport instead of just playing the sport. Yeah, we're the same way. The the way recruiting's coming so much earlier than it usually was. Getting kids on campus at your camp allows the college to actually evaluate you during those uh, important years of sixth grade to eighth and ninth grade, where we can get you on our our recruiting list and we can evaluate you and move you forward or backwards depending on your talent level. Um, so camps and clinics are becoming very, very important in our process. It allows us, as Joe mentioned, we need to get to know the kid. It allows us to evaluate the kid personality-wise, work ethic-wise, as well as from a, a soccer skills perspective. Per, uh, perspective. Uh, the Hofstra summer basket or the summer program, and which includes basketball, is like no other. Uh, any chance a kid can have to come to a camp like this and 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 be evaluated by the coaches. Uh, receive the discipline and teaching that they get here uh, on a beautiful campus is, is invaluable. Just like to thank everyone for their time and uh, their expertise, and I think this will go a long way in just helping student athletes and, like we said, their parents uh, to understand where to get involved, when not to get involved, and just the opportunities that are available here at Hofstra, and um, just to make great decisions moving forward, especially you know financially, and just to put your son or daughter in a place where they can. You know, achieve the best success.